Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar for the 2019 Macy Faculty Scholars Program. I'm Peter Goodwin, Chief Operating Officer and Treasurer at the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation in New York City. The purpose of today's web conference is to provide you an opportunity to hear from the principals involved with the Macy Faculty Scholars Program. Today we will share with you our vision for the program and some of the program's highlights. In addition, we'll spend a few moments on the application and selection process for the 2019 program. Our agenda today is two parts. First, we'll have a brief presentation that will then be followed by a question and answer period. And at the end of this question and answer period, we'll spend a final minute on some details you'll need to know in order to submit an online application to the program. This webinar is being recorded, and you will be able to view the slides and listen to the presentation as well as the Q&A portion of the webinar within the next week by visiting the Macy Foundation website. For any questions you have during today's presentation, please use the chat function on your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can at the end of the prepared remarks. And if during this webinar you need technical assistance, please contact ReadyTalk at 800-843-9166. And for the presentation, I would now turn it over to the Macy Foundation President, Dr. Holly Humphrey. Holly? Hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be interacting with all of you via this webinar. And I'm really excited and thrilled to be talking about the Macy Faculty Scholars Program. Um, this program is in place really to recognize, develop, and nurture the careers of education innovators um, in your local institutions because we see you as the future leaders of medicine and nursing education. So our aim is to select mid-career faculty who have shown great promise and provide you with protected time, mentoring, and a national network of like-minded educators. We want our scholars to be able to create educational change at your local institution and then become part of a national cohort of leaders and innovators in health professions education. This is really a career development award. We want um, candidates who will have the maximum impact um, at this point in their career and the greatest possibility and potential for future impact at their local institution as well as nationally and possibly internationally. The highlights of this program are that um, the Macy Foundation provides 50% um, salary support in order to have 50% protected time to pursue your project at your home institution. Um, we will provide, in addition to that salary support, mentoring from a national advisory committee as well as um, support for participation in Harvard Macy Institute programming. Our scholars are invited to an annual meeting where scholars present their work and develop this um, national cohort of all Macy faculty scholars, as well as um, access to interaction with other Macy grantees and other Macy programming. Okay, so who's eligible? The eligibility criteria for this program are that the program is open to any doctorally prepared faculty member at a school of medicine or a school of nursing. The nominee must have a minimum of five years as an 
active faculty member at their respective school. They must be nominated by the dean of their nursing or medical school, and there can be only one nominee from each school. The nursing or medical school that currently has a first-year scholar is ineligible to nominate a candidate during this particular cycle. Those institutions will be eligible one year hence, but they are not eligible for this particular year. The additional eligibility criteria include having identified a local faculty mentor who can not only help supervise the project, but help diminish institutional barriers to implementing that project and be readily available um, to the scholar for that kind of active problem solving that goes into implementing the very best projects um, in the local environment. We're really looking for this project to be an educational innovation, and I think as you might guess, educational in innovations can take many different types of um, form, but we're really looking um, for creativity and innovation in the best um, possible sense that might well spur a larger scale innovation down the road. All candidates um, who apply and ultimately are selected must be a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident of the United States. Okay, so now let's talk about the application itself. The application includes um, a statement of the candidate's career objectives as well as personal career goals. Um, the application includes a description of the project itself as well as a letter from the dean of the respective school, as I've already mentioned. In addition, we'd like to have a letter from the mentor who will be supervising the scholar as well as the project. We'd also like a letter from the chair of the department in which the faculty member holds their primary faculty appointment. And then an additional letter from one to two other senior faculty members who may have worked with um, the proposed scholar or have some other kind of teaching or mentoring relationship with the Macy faculty scholar. We also um, need an updated uh, CV, both of the candidate and of the mentor. Okay, once we have all that um, important information, then how will we proceed in making a selection? We're going to basically be using criteria that demonstrate, first of all, evidence of a strong commitment to a career in health professions education. We're also looking for promise as an educator and as a leader. We're looking for evidence of innovation and creativity um, previously in one's career. That obviously does not mean that um, the scholar has won you know, top prizes in innovation, but that there's evidence by the quality of the ideas um, presented that they're an innovator and that there's creativity. So um, don't feel discouraged if you haven't won a, a top prize or even if you feel like you haven't had um, that one brilliant idea because most of us haven't, but um, usually there are elements of your experience that might well lend themselves to application in a new arena or a new area or with a new methodology that might um, demonstrate innovation and creativity. We're also looking for um, the overall merit of the education, educational innovation project. We're looking for evidence of strong institutional support, which is why we um, expect a letter both from your chair and from your dean. And then we want to do our best to have an assessment of um, the institution in which you are working and um, the environment in terms of its support for innovation, creativity, and overall commitment to health professions education. 
The process itself um, will begin with a review of all applications, um, and those applications will be reviewed by the Senior Macy um, Foundation staff, and we will select semifinalists. Then we will invite our National Advisory Committee to review all of the semifinalist applications and make the selection for the finalists who will be invited to an in-person interview. Um, scholars will be notified by June 14th of 2019 and the appointment year begins on September 1st of 2019. So the next slide shows you the key dates in this application process, um, the first of which is February 13th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, which is the official deadline for submission of the application. On April 25th, um, each completed applicant will receive notification of their application status specifically whether or not they've been selected as one of the finalists. Um, the finalist interviews will take place on June 10th and 11th of 2019, and the scholars and schools will be notified by June 14th of 2019. And as I already mentioned, the appointment year begins on September 1st. At this point, I'd like to turn it back to my colleague, um, Peter Goodwin, and um, then we'll be ready to take your questions. Thank you, Holly. Um, so that concludes the formal remarks for this, uh, this web conference, and we're now entering into the, the Q&A portion, uh, which I um, think will be the rich part of this, so you can uh, pose questions to us. Um, as I uh, mentioned earlier, um, please use the chat function on your screen um, to submit a question, and we will uh, do our best to answer as many of them as possible. And as I'm looking at the chat screen now, I can see we have a number of people that are doing that. So uh, let me go to the screen and, uh, and read the questions out loud so you can hear them and Holly as well, and we will answer them. Um, so Holly, the first question relates to um, an eligibility um, consideration. Um, the, um, um, the brochure, um, and you spoke about being five years um, as a faculty member. Could you um, clarify whether that five years has to be at the same institution, or does it just have to be five years as a faculty member, potentially at multiple institutions? Yes, um, we are very... Um, particular about um, five years as a faculty member, but it does not all have to be at a single institution. So if um, you have had experience as a faculty member at multiple institutions and um, it totals five years, that makes you an eligible candidate. Thank you. Uh, the next question also related to eligibility is, um, from an interested applicant who mentions that they have a nursing program within their College of Health and Human Services. Um, and it sounds like it doesn't, they don't have a distinct College of Nursing. Are they eligible to apply? Um, if you have a nursing program within a, um, a bigger, broader institution, you are definitely eligible to apply. But just a reminder that the institution can only nominate one candidate. So. Um, in, in some institutions, there are multiple candidates within an institution, and then it's up to the dean to have a process in place to make the selection of which candidate they're going to nominate. Um, but you certainly would be eligible um, as a member of a nursing program within a health professions institution. Next question. Um, can a candidate who was a finalist last year be nominated again this year? Absolutely, yes. In fact, um, over the years since we began this program, we have seen not only a number of um, reapplicants, but we have noted that a number of um, those individuals who have ultimately been selected as Macy Faculty Scholars have, in fact, applied um, more than once. And so 
we definitely encourage you to apply again um, and certainly have um, seen firsthand that reapplicants have fared very well in our process. Okay, next question um, also related to the um, faculty uh, five year time. Um, with this five year um, time, do you have to have had your PhD for those five years? No, you do not have to have had your PhD for all five years. You must have a, a PhD or an MD, um, a doctoral degree at the time of application, but you do not need to have had that degree for all five years. However, it will need to be very clear that you have had a faculty appointment for all five of those years. Um, next question is a very technical question about the application, which I'll answer, Holly. Um, and it is, if we use citations in our project proposal, do the citations count towards our character count? And the answer is yes, they do. And in fact, even spaces count towards the character count in the, uh, in the application. So um, uh, you will have to be succinct and clear in writing that. Um, Next question is um, about the applicant institution. Um, must the program be program specific accredited or is it acceptable to be in the accreditation process? That's a good question. Um, generally, we recognize a school of nursing or medicine as a school that is degree granting. And in order to be degree granting, you would need to be accredited. So um, if your school is in the process of gaining accreditation, that means to me you're not yet um, degree granting. Um, and therefore, you would not yet be eligible. So. As soon as um, you have accreditation, um, we would be happy to consider your application. Mm -hmm. uh, next question, Holly, also related to the five years. Um, uh, if the candidate was voluntary faculty for three years and then paid faculty for the past four years, would that voluntary time count towards the five years on faculty? Um, no, we are looking for um, faculty who have been in a full-time faculty capacity for a five-year period. Um, and so any time as a volunteer faculty member would not count toward the five years of eligibility. Um, Holly, how many scholars will be selected? We will um, be planning to select five scholars, and in fact, um, we have done that in each of our uh, preceding years except for one um, when six were selected, but five is, um, our, is what we're aiming for. Um, regarding the interviews uh, that will take place in June in New York City, um, do the um, applicants' mentors attend this interview? No, the applicant mentors do not attend the interview. However, um, if selected, we do have opportunities down the road where the mentors are invited to join the scholars when they are presenting their work, but they do not attend the interview. Uh, the next question also related to uh, finalists is how many finalists are selected each year? And I'll, I'll take that one. Um, uh, we have uh, ranged anywhere from 10 to up to 13 finalists. Um, there is no hard and fast rule. Um, the only rule is that we're targeting to get to five scholars. Um, many times it's a, um, a function of the quality of the, um, the semifinalist applications and in the opinion of the National Advisory Committee um, and the senior staff of the foundation as to whether or not the number are so uh, outstanding 
uh, and so large that we want to bring in something on the order of 12 to 13 as opposed to 10 to the 11. So it's a range, um, but uh, it would be probably a minimum of 10 and a maximum of 13 that we would consider. And as I said, it depends on, on each year on the pool of, of applicants and the semifinalist applications. Um, next question, Holly, is um, about the dean's letter. And that specifically, does the letter need to come from the dean or could it come from the associate dean for medical education? Well, um, our criteria um, are that the letter comes from the dean, but it's not uncommon in my experience for the associate dean to actually draft the letter and for the letter to be co-signed perhaps by both individuals. So that would be an acceptable way, but we, we want to see support at the very highest level of the institution, which is why we ask for the letter of support from the dean. Um, and if you feel like that your dean doesn't know you, that would not be uncommon. Um, and we'd like the dean to get to know you, even through this application process. But I understand that the person who may know you best and who may know your project best and who, in fact, may know the impact of your proposed project best might be somebody at an associate dean letter. So my suggestion would be to um, consider having co-signatories to that letter. Um, regarding uh, the project uh, proposal, which is part of the application, Holly, how important is it that this project match the priorities of the Macy Foundation? Well, um, I would say strategically for you as an applicant, um, it is important to pay attention to the Macy Foundation's mission and our priority areas. However, I also just want to tell you that I personally am always excited by a great idea um, or a great innovation. I would just say that's probably a little riskier um, for you to go out on a limb in an area that um, has not been one of our um, traditional priority areas. So you can definitely go for it, but um, it is probably a little bit more of a risk to be um, going into an area that um, we have not identified as a priority. Uh, regarding the, uh, the mentor for the applicant and ultimately the scholar, is it allowable to have co-mentors, um, for example, two, uh, rather than just one mentor? Yes, it is um, allowable to have more than one mentor. In fact, we have some current scholars who have more than one mentor. But I would just caution you um, that if you have more than one mentor, it should be very clear what role each mentor is playing. And ideally, um, you would have mentors who would have different areas of expertise. Um, so I would not suggest having redundant mentors who have similar backgrounds and areas of expertise, but if your project lends itself to more than one mentor, ideally those mentors are bringing different bodies of experience to help not only inform but to guide your project and you personally as one of our scholars. Uh, Holly, the next question is about the proposal itself. Um, uh, is a person interested in learning about what should be included in that proposal as part of the application? Well, um, the, the proposal should include ideally a very clear statement of your project description. So that might take the form of your project goal. And then your project should have a few key specific aims. Um, the reason I'm encouraging you to consider writing it that way is it will add clarity to what it is you're, you're trying to um, put forward. Very often um, I read proposals that have so much 
preamble, I get lost in the preamble of what the project is actually going to be. So my suggestion is to write a clear statement of intent with two or three specific aims, and then you can go back and, and give me you know, some of the background and, um, and flush out um, that project. So that's just a, kind of a, a way to present your idea to enhance the chance that we will understand it and that we will, from the very first opening words and opening phrases in your project description, understand what it is you're trying to do, and everything that follows will educate us on um, the background, the relevance, um, and the potential impact um, for that project. Yeah, uh, if I may, I would also add uh, a few other things, having reviewed a lot of the proposals over time. Um, one is we're, um, as the brochure states, it's, we're looking for an educational innovation project. So it's important for you to speak to what it is about what you're proposing is innovative, uh, whether it be at your institution or whether it be more broadly innovative. So I would um, urge you to do that. I think it's important that you also uh, build in some measures uh, for success so that you will be able to track how the project is uh, proceeding um, along the way so that it's clear to the committee and to the staff here as to how you are going to measure success when you get there. And then the other um, thing I would add is since this once again is an educational project, I think it's important that you speak to your, your educational theory of change. Um, or your educational framework, if you will, um, that, you're, that is grounding your proposal um, so that it is firmly rooted in, a, uh, in, a, in a, an established theory or in some cases maybe a, a, a recently emerging theory um, uh, uh, in education. Uh, next question is, um, individual interested in how many applications we receive annually. Um, and that number does vary um, over time, but I think the range that we have seen is anywhere from roughly 75 to 90 to 95 proposals per year. Um, so that gives you a sense of what it has been, but we're hoping that this will stimulate even more uh, and we'll set a new record this year. Um, Let's see, about, this next question is about the faculty mentor. Um, does the uh, local faculty mentor for the applicant and the scholar need to be a senior faculty in the same school? Um, no, not necessarily. Um, in general, the mentors are more senior, um, mainly because they are more experienced and they have a body of experience and expertise that will lend itself well um, to your project. Um, but they certainly do not need to be the most senior person in the field. They need to be the person who's really most accessible to you um, to develop your project and to implement your project. Um, so definitely not um, the most senior, and definitely um, not from, I, I'm not quite sure what you mean by the same school, um, but what we have seen in terms of some successful applications have been mentors that actually may be in related fields. So I could imagine that there's a mentor in a different school um, that may help inform your project. Um, so you still need to have the letter of support from the dean of your school, but it's possible that one of your mentors um, could come from a different school for the reason that I said. It should be really clear why there's a mentor coming from some other area, um, but that's not uncommon and sometimes it's actually an asset because other fields um, can inform medicine and nursing in ways that um, enrich our understanding of a given area. So I certainly um, would encourage you to have a mentor in another school if that makes sense for your project. 
Okay. Uh, next question is getting at um, the um, credentials, I guess, of the applicant, and that is whether or not um, an applicant who has a more of a senior rank is would be more considered more competitive. So would a, an associate professor be more competitive than an assistant professor, um, as an example? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, as we've already emphasized during um, this call and through our application materials, we do require five years of experience um, as a faculty member. But whether your rank is assistant professor or associate professor is not as important to us um, because institutions vary sometimes fairly considerably in terms of when someone might achieve a different um, professorial rank. Um, what's more important is what is your actual experience and what is your actual track record um, in your field or in your area of interest. So we're looking for evidence of promise and that needs to be evidence somewhere um, on your CV and um, in your letters of support. Sometimes that evidence comes through in a professorial rank, but we don't specify that it's assistant or associate or what we do specify is mid-career and we're using the five-year faculty appointment as the surrogate for mid-career. I would just comment that um, to date, our experiences has been that many, many of the Macy scholars um, uh, are starting out as assistant professors. Um, that is to say, when they apply to us and when they successfully, um, those who are successful as scholars. So it's very common for us to see assistant professors. Um, uh, the next question is about just clarifying the, uh, the, the number of nominations that can um, be put forth. And I'll just answer that by saying and repeat what is also in the brochure and Holly mentioned that um, you can nominate only one um, from a school of medicine and from a school of nursing. So if you have a university that has both the school of medicine and school of nursing, you can nominate one from each. But um, you cannot nominate more than one from a school of medicine or a school of nursing. So next question is about the, um, the projects, the educational innovation project, which is part of the application. The question is, can this be broadly defined, that is to say the innovation, or is this course development specific project? Yeah, that's a really important question. Um, your project can be as broad or as narrow as you wish. However, my advice to you is that in general, the projects that lend themselves best um, for a description for this um, two years of support tends to be a pretty focused project. And it's, um, I think, more difficult to make a real big picture project um, successful in a two year time frame. So, you may want to think about your particular project in a bigger context. That's always, I think, important and exciting to do. Um, but, but place that specific project in the bigger context by talking about how will your project have an impact down the road. And it's not uncommon for a project that's part of your proposal to either follow work that you've already done through some pilot programming or some curricular innovations that you've already done and this project becomes a follow-up to work that you've already done. Sometimes it's the case that this project is the first step. This project is the pilot project or this project has a pilot project phase irrespective of where your project fits in on that spectrum, um, it is a good idea to tell us how that project fits into 
a bigger picture. So perhaps um, go ahead and tell us what you would do as a follow-up to this project, depending upon you know, what results you get or what impact you see. Sometimes it's hard to know what that's going to look like until you've actually done it because you learn so many things along the way. Um, but the bottom line of what I'm saying is don't go so broad with your project that it becomes impossible for our committee to find the tangible element of what you're actually trying to describe to us. So make sure there is a focus but we'd love to um, hear how your focus fits into some bigger picture. Okay, the next question, uh, which I'll take, Holly, is may the funds be used for project costs or are they limited to paying the salary and fringe? So the Macy Faculty Scholar Award is really, as Holly said, a career development award. Um, it is intended to provide protected time for the scholar for them to um, not only implement the project, but also for professional development as well. Um, we provide uh, up to $100,000 um, for that protected time. We also will include fringe benefits on top of that. And then there is a small amount of incidental money that's set aside for the scholars' travel and professional development. So there is no project money built into the, um, the scholar awards. Uh, we look to the institution of the scholar um, to, to commit to supporting them in many different ways. It's not just their professional development locally and their promotion um, as a, um, in, the, in the institution um, a, as a leader, but also um, if there are some other project-related costs that we would expect the institution to um, bring that to the table as a form of matching support. Uh, next question, Holly, is um, an individual who has a situation where the school does not have department chairs, only a dean. Um, and so the question is, um, do you need another letter from someone else, or will one letter from the dean suffice? Okay, so that's a good question. You definitely need the letter from the dean. And we are using um, the department chair letter as the person who has day-to-day -day responsibility for your um, work. And so if your institution is not organized with department chairs, I would suggest um, getting the letter from the person who has the direct responsibility for the faculty appointments, um, for the day-to-day -day assignments of um, the work that you do, perhaps that's a division um, chief, um, but my guess is there would be somebody between you, a mid-career faculty member, and a dean. Um, and that will vary by institution. Most commonly that will be a division director and a department chair. Um, so. It, it's fine if you don't have a department chair. It's fine to use one of those other surrogates, but it should it should be clear that this person has a responsibility for overseeing um, all of the faculty who would be appointed in the area in which you, you are doing your work. Okay, here's a question about the interview, and the um, party is interested in knowing how important that is to the final decision. Um, and could it be done virtually, or is it a personal interview? Okay, um, I'm going to start off answering that, and then I will invite Peter to, um, to add his voice of experience, which is richer and deeper than mine, since I am uh, new as uh, the president of the foundation. I did have a chance to um, sit in on a number of the interviews in the most recent selection process, and I would say that the interview is a very important um, part of this process. It's really what brings your application to life. It's um, the experience that um, tells the faculty advisory committee, which is the selection committee, who you are as a person, um, where your energy and passion comes from, and how that gets translated through your project. I think it would be a significant loss to um, be doing the interview um, virtually. So the in-person interview is, um, 
I think, a, um, a real asset um, to your application and ultimately um, selection. Peter? Yeah, I, I couldn't have said it better. I think the interview is, um, is critical. Um, we, um, uh, when you've reached that point of the um, application process, you are um, at sort of the very top, in our opinion, of the, of the pool of applicants, but it is still a competition, and we are uh, entertaining you know, more than twice the number of uh, positions or scholars that we could actually select, so it is um, very critical that, um, um, that the applicant come prepared um, to um, not only present themselves but to engage in a conversation um, for up to an hour with the advisory committee and the senior Macy staff that are there. So it is, it is, um, it is crucial. Um, uh, and it, it cannot be done virtually. Um, it is that important that um, it needs to be done in person, which is one of the reasons why we are you know, having an, a webinar in December and giving you dates so that, uh, and informing you along the way so that you as applicants will be able to set aside this time uh, and, uh, and, and join us in New York if you are selected to be a finalist. So Holly, um, next question is, has to do with, um, uh, uh, from a nursing school, there are not many senior ranked faculty in the nursing department at this person's facility. Now, would it be appropriate to have a senior ranking faculty member from another department serve as mentor? Um, yes, that is absolutely acceptable. And as I mentioned earlier, um, Sometimes it's not only appropriate, but it actually adds to your project to have someone um, from another department or even another school or even another institution. Um, the most important thing about that um, mentor letter, or if you have more than one mentor, as again we've already um, commented on, the most important thing is that that mentor has a body of experience and expertise that will be valuable to you and to your project. Um, and then the other really important ingredient is that this mentor um, is available and accessible to you. Um, and that um, is it, sometimes hard for us as a selection committee to, to determine from your application. Um, and from the letter of support, but we're going to do our best to um, try to be reading between the lines about that um, mentor's availability, accessibility. Sometimes it, it comes through those letters how experienced they are as a mentor, how many other people or projects have they mentored, or how much interaction have they had with you in other domains? Have they been um, a colleague of yours on institutional committees, or have you worked on other projects together? How, how do they know you, and in what capacity have you worked together? So those things are far more important than which particular department, or which particular school, or even which particular institution um, they're a part of. Okay, great. Next question um, is from uh, a potential applicant who wants to know whether or not um, they have to have all the technical skills required to conduct a project, or can the applicant partner with experts from other um, institutes or departments uh, as part of a team approach? Yeah. We um, love teamwork, we love collaboration, and we do not expect any of our Macy faculty scholars to be so um, multi-talented that they would have all the skills. So one of your um, jobs as an applicant is to figure out um, what skill you do have, what experience and expertise you do have, and where are the gaps, and where do you need to fill those gaps in. And very often that does come through the experience of a mentor. So um, I would definitely encourage you to continue thinking, of, thinking that way. Um, it's not at all uncommon to not have all of the skills. Sometimes that's in the arena of statistical measurement. Um, so to have a, a statistician on your team 
would be absolutely um, sometimes imperative to your project. Um, to have an uh, individual who has experience in quality and safety or in health systems um, design or in some other IT kind of work can be very important to a successful project. Holly, the next question um, is about the letters of recommendation. Um, the senior faculty letters that are provided, do they need to be within, from the same academic department as the applicant? Um, no, they do not have to be from the same academic department. Very often they are from the same academic department. But again, um, we, we love interdisciplinary work. Um, and if your project is a project that lends itself to um, faculty letters of support from another department that's completely acceptable. Again, that should be based um, predominantly on the prior experience you have with that faculty member. So it's more of a grassroots, real world experience than it is a strategic decision. In other words, um, if you are in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and you think that the most well-known person at your institution is um, a faculty member in the Department of Pediatrics, um, but you haven't really worked with that person before or that person does not have um, an area of expertise that kind of brings the two of you together, it would not be wise to choose a well-known figure who you haven't worked with or who doesn't know you or who has no um, intersecting interest with um, you and with your project. So choose the person um, to write your letter who really knows you because honestly that comes through in letters. When, when people have worked with you and they know you and they know your track record and they know your potential, that's the person you want as your letter writer um, because that will come through in what they um, say about you. Regarding the, uh, the project, um, does it, um, it, and the applicant acknowledges it needs to be an innovation, um, does it have to be a completely new project or is it possible for the project to be something that extends, accelerates, um, or expands a current project in a new and innovative way? Absolutely. It can be a project that expands on work that you've already done, um, done before, and as you already said, in a new and innovative way. That's not a requirement, but it's completely okay for this to be phase two of work that you've done before. So it can be either a brand new um, area that you've never engaged in before, but you've done other work in related areas, or it can be, as you said, a continuation of uh, work that you've already done, but you're taking it in a new direction and doing it in an innovative way. Um, here's a question uh, from someone who would like to get some examples of what fellows or scholars in recent years have worked on for their projects. And, um, um, what I would uh, recommend you do um, is to visit our website um, and go to the Macy Faculty Scholars uh, tab on the website and you can actually view all of the foundation scholars and the projects that they're working on. Uh, next question related to eligibility is for clarification that a DNP is an eligible degree. Yes. Okay. Holly, is there a focus on undergraduate educational projects or is graduate uh, educational project acceptable? Oh, not only acceptable, um, but um, definitely embraced. So um, we, of course, um, support undergraduate medical and nursing education, um, but we're very interested to receive um, proposals that might involve um, residents or um, graduate trainees. And regarding the, uh, the, the, the proposed project, um, does the number of learners that would be impacted by it affect the competitiveness uh, of the project and therefore the candidates? 
Um, that's a good question. Um, technically, no. Um, in other words, in other words, if if you are proposing a brand new idea that's never been done before at your institution, and you're going to start off with a group of learners that um, numbers, uh, let's say, 10 or 20 or 30 people, that is not um, something that would make the project unworthy. However, your job in your project proposal is to tell us how you will ultimately expand that project. Um, if what you learn by implementing the project with a small group of learners, how will that project ultimately be disseminated to a larger group of learners or to an entire class of learners if it's an undergraduate uh, focused project or to an entire residency program. And then um, over time, is there potential for this project to ultimately go institution-wide? Or is it the kind of project that might ultimately go nationwide? I mean, those are obviously big dreams. But certainly don't think about needing to start off at the whole institution level or the whole department level or the whole class level. You can definitely start with a smaller cohort, but um, we would like to see the possibility of your great idea um, ultimately moving beyond that small cohort, but you don't have to do that within the time frame of your project proposal. But tell us your vision. Tell us where it could go if it works out successfully. Regarding the, uh, the innovation project, um, would we consider one that is an educational research project, or should the project be more of an innovative program? I think the answer is yes, that we would. And in fact, if once again, if you were to go to our website and look at some of the scholars and their projects, you will see that there are several of them who have, uh, proposed and are implementing and have implemented um, education research projects as part of their work as a Macy scholar. I, I agree with that. So, Holly, um, this uh, the program is intended as a career development uh, program, and that's what the award is for: is career development. Um, how do you, how does the foundation target the right level of experience um, in determining career development? What's what's our thinking there? Well, um, the right level of experience, the surrogate marker for that, is really the five years experience on the faculty. Um, so we're pretty strict about that particular eligibility criterion because um, we expect that with five years of experience on the faculty, even if you spent you know, your early years working in one area or doing primarily clinical work or doing primarily research, and now you're working in a different area, that experience is still valuable. And the five years is what helps us um, determine that you're eligible in a mid-career kind of way. I would also add to that um, uh, that for a faculty member who we would consider to be senior and accomplished and well-established, that this award um, would not be as much of a benefit to them in terms of creating that boost um, in, their, in their career. Um, uh, we are looking to find the future leaders um, in health professions education. And um, so um, to sort of support Holly's notion that we're looking for those people that have sort of the five years and above and not someone who's already well established and quite frankly doesn't need the Macy Faculty Scholar Award. Um, so um, we have time for one last question before we approach the wrap-up. 
Um, and let me just go through the list here. We have more questions than we can answer. Um, uh, the question is a very technical question, but are the applicant institutions responsible for travel costs related to the in-person interviews in New York City? And I'll take that. Um, uh, no, if, uh, the, um, if you are invited to join us in New York City for the interview, the Macy Foundation will pay all, all of your reasonable travel and lodging expenses while you um, come here to New York to meet with the advisory committee and the senior staff of the Macy Foundation. So we are uh, bumping up against the hour, um, and I'd like to just make a few final um, uh, wrap-up comments and then ask Holly if she has any final remarks um, before we end this, uh, this web conference. Uh, so, um, we are utilizing an online application for this program, and if you have not already done so, um, you should go to our website, um, under the Macy, and under the Macy Faculty Scholars section, um, you can register there. Um, there is a tab, and you can click on a tab that says Apply, and that will take you to the application, and you can then register. Your email address and a unique password that you create will be your identifier, and it will allow you to start the application. Um, and during the application process, you may save and return to the application as often as you like prior to submitting it to the foundation. Um, you will also need to get the tax identification number for your school as part of this registration process. So um, that may be hard for you to obtain, you know, in a, in a quick and easy way. So think about that and see if you can start finding out where you can obtain that. Um, and if you have questions during the application process, you may email us at info at macyfoundation.org. Um, but before you email us, we encourage you to view the frequently asked questions that are posted on our website under the Macy Scholars tab. Um, since the program was announced, we have had a number of questions from people who have called us or emailed us. Um, we've posted some of those questions with answers, and we think these will be most helpful to you as you um, consider the application. And we'll continue to update the frequently asked questions throughout the open application period, which ends on February the 13th. I would also um, say that we were not able to get to all the questions that came in through the chat room. We are sorry for that. Um, uh, we're pleased that there was such interest and so many questions, but we could not get to them. But if you email us at the info at macyfoundation.org address, we will uh, get back to you and answer your question. Uh, and then um, lastly, as a reminder, um, we will by next week have both the audio portion and the slides from this session available to view on our website. Uh, Holly, do you have anything to to say as we sign off. I want to thank you uh, for participating in this webinar today, and I look forward to uh, meeting many of you virtually through your application um, to this program, and um, especially look forward to meeting um, the finalists and ultimately the scholars. So um, good luck to each of you, and I hope that you will have um, some wonderful opportunities in your own institutions to implement your ideas, whether or not they make their way to um, our application, but I certainly hope they do. Thank you.